So here we're standing at the entrance of the fifth section, the photography uh, section of the exhibition, which is really one of those fascinating parts because even for us, while we were doing the research over the six years in which we were preparing this exhibition, a lot of these artists, photographers, were not even on, on our radar. They were not on anybody's radar because they had been completely forgotten or lost. And then we were finding the photographs and based on what we were finding, we could then find the names and resurrect kind of back into life and into the literature who these photographers were. So there's a lot of things that you see in here that you find in the photography of the period, surrealist photography like photomontage, solarization, dépaysement, and again, a lot of female photographers, male photographers, sometimes they were working together and creating, you know, maybe their own answer to the cadavre exquis, you you know, these kind of like collaborations between artists where they do different parts and then it comes together into a new work. It's really a fascinating um, section that will be a surprise to many, many people as much as the entire show is actually a surprise. Two things particularly that stand out in the photography section is on one hand, how these artists were actually using photography to, to subvert the use of ancient Egypt in the narrative that was all about nationalism. So we have to remember that at the time, Egypt was a young, modern nation. There were, a lot of artists looked at the past in order to kind of construct an image of national identity. And of course, with something like pharaonic art in your history, that's such a great resource to draw on. These artists, however, Ahili Bekhti, were not interested in nationalism in any shape or form. So they were creating artworks similar to the one behind us where they would actually make playful images that made fun, in a sense, of this colossal kind of past, like the temples, the pyramids, the, pharaoh, the pharaonic sculptures. And this is a great example of, by Etienne Zved, a Jewish-Hungarian artist who fled Hungary to Egypt at the time, and he was working with the group. And you can see how he's kind of reversed the scale. So the actual temple is small, and the, the hand of the human being is a giant hand. So there's a lot of playfulness in, in, in there. Another point that comes through very clearly in this particular section of the exhibition is the connection to British surrealism due to the presence of Lee Miller, the photographer who was living in Egypt at the time and married to an Egyptian businessman. So Lee moves to Cairo in 1933, 1934. She stays there until 1939. And while she's there, she starts having a long distance love affair while married to an Egyptian with uh, Roland Penrose, one of the prominent figures in British surrealism, who comes to visit her in Cairo, gets to meet the Ahi Liberté members, um, publishes their manifesto in the London Bulletin in 1939. So a lot of interesting connections happen with Britain because of uh, Lee Miller being there and the connection with Roland Penrose, but Lee herself with other photographers in the group would go out to the desert and create a lot of interesting surrealist photography uh, that we see in this section as well. One of the things that is really a, a great discovery to many people when they come to the exhibition is to get a taste of what actually the society looked like at that time. Um, and the fact that we have here a, a great section dedicated to photography is also a testament to really how modern or how current actually the society at that time was. So not only was it a city by many intellectuals and people discussing and uh, it was a destination, I guess, for a certain time of elite jet set at that time, but it really gives us a taste also that it really was a modern thriving city and a modern thriving society that was by all means part of a global discourse. Um, and unfortunately, perhaps because of uh, the way media uh, works, perhaps because the way history has been played out in colonialism, all we really often know about Egypt is the great pharaonic past, of course, perhaps a little bit the Islamic, so-called Islamic art period, and then the current political situation and turmoil and problems. But we really don't know anything about Cairo of, say, the early 20th century and how that played a role in an international network of cosmopolitan cities. And I think especially more than any other section, I think the photography gives a great, great uh, taste of what um, that would look like. <laughs>